Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the cardiology grant round. Today, we're starting off our George Vetrovec Cardiology Symposium. A um, few quick words on the symposium. The George Vetrovec Cardiology Symposium was founded in 2015 by faculty and friends on the occasion of his retirement from VCU to support lecture for the Division of Cardiology. Dr. Vetrovec was chairman of cardiology for 18 years, director of the cardiac cat catheterization lab for 38 years and an associate chairman of medicine for clinical affairs for 23 years. Dr. Vetrovec's career focused on improving the management of coronary artery disease, particularly related to coronary interventional techniques. Dr. Vetrovec and Dr. Michael Cauley performed the first coronary balloon angioplasty at VCU in 1979, less than two years after the first was performed in the world. Dr. Vetrovec and the VCU Medical Center remains pioneers in the evolution of percutaneous coronary intervention, and we thank him for his kind giving for, for this opportunity to invite Dr. Alexandria Lenski, our speaker of the day. Dr. Lenski graduated um, medical school here at MCV. Later on, he, she uh, finished her training in internal medicine cardiology, a thought intervention cardiology at Washington Hospital Center at DC. She is currently professor of medicine in the section of cardiology at Yale School of Medicine and practicing cardiologist at Yale New Haven Hospital. Dr. Lansky is director of the Yale Heart and Vascular Clinical Research Program and the Cardiovascular Research Group. She is a clinical trialist specializing in investigating device and pharmacologic treatment for coronary artery disease and heart failure. She has dedicated her career to leading clinical and angiographic evolution of more than 500 clinical trials in a broad range of cardiovascular therapeutic areas. Her interest has been to evaluate coronary and peripheral device and pharmacologic mechanism of resinosis, predictors, and sex-based outcome after revascularization stroke and your protection during transaortic valve placement. Dr. Lansky has authored and co-authored more than 500 academic peer-reviewed manuscripts in the field of interventional cardiology, angiography, and women's cardiovascular health. She chaired the American Health Association Statement on Interventions in Women and most recently the Academic Research Consortium defining neurologic endpoints in clinical cardiovascular trials and served on the 2017 FDA panel for endpoints in clinical trials. And we welcome her back to her alma mater to give her expertise on the topic neuroprotection during TAVR, rationale, and evidence. And as always, well, we have the CME credit, so uh, the information is below. Without further ado, Dr. Lenski. So thank you very much. That's such a kind invitation and, and uh, congratulations to, to uh, Dr. Vetrovec. Um, you know, we go way back uh, and have had such an incredible um, career in the past couple of decades. I have to say we were very lucky to be, you know, in the, in the, at a time where interventional cardiology was really in its formative years. And I think uh, Dr. Vetrovec was one of the pioneers. So it's really an honor for me to be here today. I, I really appreciate this invitation. All right, so now I'm gonna do what's very challenging to me and that is to, to navigate. Um, oh, I cannot share my screen. Uh, <laughs> so I think you need to uh, release that. Yep, go ahead. Oh, there we go. Beautiful. Okay. All right. Uh, all right. Hang on one second. I told you this was the most challenging part of uh, of the talk. There. Should do you see? Can you see my screen? Yes. Wonderful. Okay. So again, thank you very much. I'm going to be talking today about uh, some work that I have done in the past decade, I would say. It's, it's been a long journey. There's a lot to tell here. Um, and um, it, very interesting observations. So, um, um, you know, obviously, cerebral protection um, has had sort of a, a difficult course, I would say, to try and establish it itself in this field. And I'm gonna try and um, show you some of the challenges 
that we've um, seen as we've evaluated this. Um, just uh, here are my conflicts. Um, I just want to highlight as we uh, talk, as I talk about this, uh, my work it, with the Keystone device, this is not an approved device, so it's not on the market, it probably won't be on the market uh, anytime soon, but nonetheless, I've, I've done a lot of work um, in this space. So I think it's uh, no surprise to anyone that uh, TAVR is now approved as a, as a welcome alternative to surgical um, AVR for symptomatic severe aortic stenosis across the spectrum of risk. Um, why is that important? Well, you can see here in um, clinical practice over, well over 30% of patients um, that with uh, severe symptomatic aortic stenosis were really not candidates for surgery. So this is really filling uh, an unmet need and a gap in our, in our um, therapies for, for our patients. Um, when we talk about stroke um, during TAVA, this is from the TVT registry, you can see from its inception in 2011, that's when it was approved, um, over time, this takes us to 2017, but there's been uh, an update. Um, stroke rates have been relatively constant. We just really haven't seen any dip uh, over time uh, in the stroke rates. There's been an update here from 17, uh, 2017 to current. And there has been with the addition of low risk patients, um, there's been a slight uh, reduction in stroke, stroke rates, but really nothing uh, very meaningful. So very constant stroke rates. I always say uh, to, to, to folks that the best way to, for our patients to avoid stroke strokes is to actually refer them to TAVA uh, rather than a surgical uh, treatment. This is particularly um, obvious from the intermediate risk and low risk randomized clinical studies that have compared TAVA to surgical uh, interventions where stroke rates are consistently lower with TAVA. Having said that, we still uh, want to try and optimize the outcomes um, of, for our patients undergoing TAVA. And that's the reason for, for really uh, digging into this and trying to see how we can um, minimize this complication. So one of the questions is, can we uh, reduce stroke uh, by uh, being more proficient with uh, these procedures? And again, I think this is an important uh, publication from the TBT registry that looked at outcomes. It looked at mortality, it looked at vascular complications, et cetera. And pretty much every single complication that you can imagine is improved with uh, increases in case volume with the exception of stroke. So stroke rates remain constant. It doesn't matter how many cases you're doing uh, either as an individual operator or at your center. So clearly this seems to be sort of a mechanical issue um, that, that is unpredictable and seems to be unavoidable. Um, this is another uh, registry coming from Europe, but very reproducible. We've seen this time and time again, um, where um, out of all the strokes uh, and the stroke rate uh, out to 30 days, and this, in this case, it's about 2.4%, so actually very consistent with what we see uh, in the TVT registry. The vast majority of the strokes are happening within um, seven days. So you can see here 80% happen within seven days. And a good third of these happen within the first day. And if you take a look at the disabling stroke, the major strokes, again, they're clustered right here, right after the procedure. So again, speaking to a mechanical issue with uh, the procedure, this is truly iatrogenic. I mean, it's, it's we're, uh, we're causing this um, uh, during the procedure itself. Well, when we look at these uh, highly calcified degenerated valves, it's, it's no wonder that we're releasing debris. And this is work uh, that we did with uh, one of our colleagues in London, uh, Mike Mullen. 
where um, this was uh, based on a CE Mark study that we were, we conducted looking at one of our neural protection devices, but essentially we were interested in 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 looking at when uh, the debris was being released. So based on transcranial Doppler. We looked at every single stage of the procedure here. And while you can see this is solid debris being um, released and gaseous debris, um, essentially debris is being released at every stage of the procedure, but most uh, in crossing the valve and um, the exchange of catheters. Here you can see uh, many more uh, debris being embolized and during valve positioning. So any kind of um, friction motion across this valve is uh, really the trigger for more embolization. So um, just to, I want to take you back and I'll kind of walk you through some of the work that we've done specifically. And we started off with um, a study called NeuroTAVA. NeuroTAVA was really done because we wanted to um, dig into this, we wanted to understand um, the best way to assess the patients. We wanted to understand the um, incidence of uh, neurologic injury based on diffusion weighted MRI. It was a very small series. We screened our patients with very detailed neuro neurologic and neurocognitive assessment. Uh, here's our procedure. In four days, we did a diffusion weighted MRI. Post procedure, we repeated all the neurologic and neurocognitive assessments as we did here at 30 days. And what was important in this study is that we, um, we, we uh, had neuro neurologists and the same neurologist evaluating the patients um, at each step of the way. So important findings from this small study, again, you can see it was only 34 patients, but I think it made uh, an important point. So number one, 94% uh, of patients had new cerebral lesions or injury detected by diffusion weighted MRI. Overall, if you, uh, when we looked at the total lesion volume, we're looking at the cubic millimeters here, it was 300 cubic millimeters um, on average um, for each one of these patients following the procedure. That's a sizable amount of cerebral injury. And here we just looked at different um, uh, sectors, but you can see 60% had, again, sizable uh, injury here with greater than 150 cubic millimeters. So the point here is that neurologic injury is prevalent. It's happening pretty much in every patient that we see, and uh, we're seeing a very large amount of injury. Now, the other take home from this was that when we assessed stroke, and this was driven uh, based on our systematic approach and serial approach uh, with a neurologist going into the room and evaluating the patients, uh, we found in hospital 6.8%, 7.3% at 30 days. Uh, disabling stroke rates uh, were 2.4%, so only one out of 40. Again, this, the series is very low. Um, very small. But this seemed to be higher than what had been reported in other series. And the other observation that we made was that depending on how we define stroke, um, there clearly is a, a gradation, right? So if you're looking at disabling stroke, it's 2.4, but then if you open it up to all stroke, it goes up to 7%, et cetera. This is worsening in NIH stroke scale combined with neurologic injury based on diffusion weighted MRI. That's, that's how the, the uh, Stroke Association defines stroke. So you can see that the rates are even um, higher. And um, interestingly, when we line this up compared to the randomized clinical studies at the time, this was high risk and intermediate risk. Um, while the disabling stroke rates were consistent, the overall stroke rates, as I said, seem to be much higher. So our take homes from this was that, again, neurologic injury seemed to be ubiquitous in all patients. Um, but there seems to be some underreporting um, in, in the uh, clinical studies, and it clearly seemed to us to underscore the need for cerebral protection in, in these patients. 
And of course, our series, the NeuroTava, was not the only one. There have been many series now looking at exactly the same thing based on neurologic imaging um, showing that the vast majority of patients have um, some neurologic injury. Um, and taking this to the uh, neurology literature, there are, well, these, these, um, these are acutely asymptomatic. Um, it's not to say that in the longer term, it may not be associated with um, complications such as uh, depression, cognitive dysfunction, et cetera. And there have been links again in the neuro with the neurology literature that, that make that link. Um, also in the TAVI literature, there is um, a, a link between finding um, neurologic injury and the subsequent risk of stroke as an independent uh, risk factor. So clearly this is an important thing. Well, because of the difficulty in, um, in um, having consistent definitions across the board, we felt it was important at the time to kind of bring consensus to this. Um, I reached out to the FDA and talked to them and, uh, you know, uh, asking them whether they felt that this was an important uh, thing to address. And uh, of course, they said, yes, uh, we need to understand this. We do need to have consistency across clinical trials. And uh, we therefore undertook this, um, this initiative called, that we call NeuroArc. And essentially we pulled together uh, experts in the field that really sort of um, um, included uh, folks in the interventional and surgical arena, neurologists and uh, neuroradiologists, and of course our regulators. But the point here was to bring consistency to how we assess, measure, and classify neurologic endpoints in cardiovascular procedures and clinical trials. So not necessarily specifically for TAVA, but in general. Uh, this was sort of very interesting um, endeavor. I have to say it was a lot of fun. We came together twice. This is just a nice picture from our second meeting, the full day meeting uh, that we had. Uh, in New York at the Yale Club, some, some good memories here. But anyhow, so um, this is what we came up with in terms of our definitions. And again, we were trying to kind of like consolidate uh, different definitions that have been put out there. And we came up with three groups. The first one we call overt CNS injury. These are acutely symptomatic. And again, we dissected out the, the underlying etiology, whether it was ischemic stroke, um, cerebral hemorrhage, subarachnoid hemorrhage. And what we felt was important here, these hypoxic ischemic injury, which of course, any kind of global uh, neurologic injury uh, from hypertension, cardiac arrest, et cetera, uh, we felt was uh, important to kind of pull out and dissect out uh, of this cohort. The second type here, a covert CNS injury, these are acutely asymptomatic, but um, demonstrate um, injury on uh, brain imaging. And again, um, these are divided into um, CNS infarction uh, versus hemorrhage. And the third type here are neurologic dysfunction without CNS injury. So they are acutely symptomatic, but there's nothing on brain imaging. And this is where we have our, our uh, TIA patients as well as patients with delirium. We found from and uh, part of the uh, consensus, uh, uh, we wanted to highlight this issue of delirium because at least in the surgical literature, delirium um, is linked with the worst, uh, worst prognosis. And in min many instances, up to 50% actually is a symptom or a sign of, um, of stroke. And the recommendation was to um, do imaging in these patients to try and see whether or not um, uh, there was an underlying uh, stroke or there is an underlying stroke in, in, in those patients. So um, FDA um, was one of their strong uh, issues with the, was that they wanted these definitions to be consistent 
with prior definitions. And this is um, absolutely aligned. So that was sort of a big focus of what we were trying to do. So our type ones are uh, the overt CNS injury is consistent with VARC2. And our type one and two are consistent with the definitions that are put forward by the American Stroke Association. So we, we met that, that goal, that was important. And of course these are published. Um, the, the other, um, some of the other uh, components of this consensus are um, really trying to um, highlight how to apply these in clinical studies. So uh, of course we were coming um, at this with, a, with an interest in neuroprotection trials where neurologic injury is actually a metric of effectiveness. Um, if, if we look at most of the TAVI trials or most of the surgical studies, et cetera, when you think about stroke, it's a safety endpoint, but in these neuroprotection trials, it's actually an effectiveness endpoint because we're trying to prevent stroke. And in our recommendation, in our guidance document, we're uh, really recommending uh, to include imaging and diffusion weighted MRI in, in these, um, these studies so that we can really dig into these subclinical uh, neurologic injuries. So um, anyhow, a really, I think, um, important document that now is being adopted in many other um, consensus and other ARC um, defining um, 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 strategies. So let me switch now and, and talk a little bit about uh, prevention. So as you know, there's a whole host of different um, devices that are being developed and have been tested. Um, the one that is currently approved and on the market in the United States is the Sentinel device. It's a capture device. Um, it has basically two little baskets here that go into the innominate and the common carotid. It's positioned a place through a right radial uh, six French access. Um, so I'll talk about this just to point out here that there are many other devices that are being um, developed and will be evaluated for those of you um, that are doing TAVA. Uh, you're gonna be seeing the M-Block device uh, being starting a clinical trial next year. The Emboliner um, and the Emboline trial, again, is another, it's a sheath-based device uh, and filter that's made of nitinol, and that will also be uh, in clinical trials um, coming in 2022. So a lot, um, you know, a lot of uh, new um, technologies being assessed in this, in this field. So, but just coming back to the Sentinel, I'm, I'm sure some of you are very familiar with these data, but this was the clinical study that led to the approval of the Sentinel device. And uh, it was relatively small, 345 patients, randomized clinical study that essentially was designed to show safety and effectiveness. The safety was based on a composite of all-cause death, stroke, and acute kidney injury stage three. Uh, compared to a historical performance goal. It met that, that, it met that endpoint, as you can see here, and compared within the randomized uh, arms, you can see that uh, here's the device, the um, outcomes were very similar and at least numerically lower with the device compared to controls. Um, interestingly, Sentinel uh, did not meet the primary effectiveness endpoint, which was total lesion volume in protected brain regions. Um, but the panel that reviewed this at FDA was convinced enough based on the capture of debris. Um, so all cases um, that were recovered demonstrated that debris was captured and this was um, assessed in a, in a pathology lab by Dr. Renu Vamani, um, showing the capture of all sorts of different types of debris, including uh, foreign material, calcification, valve tissue, et cetera. Um, and uh, this, again, led to the approval of the device. And here are the overall uh, events uh, for, the, for the cohort. You can see that strokes, it was not powered for stroke, um, um, so not significant, but there was about a 40% numerical reduction here 
with the device. Um, and interestingly, in a post hoc analysis, um, by moving up the assessment of stroke, you can see here at 72 hours, while again, not significant, but certainly a trend, there was a 63% reduction post-procedure in stroke rates with, uh, with the device uh, compared to controls. So anyhow, this was all um, basically the evidence that led to the approval of Sentinel um, for this indication. Now, since then, there's been a number of um, single center uh, propensity matched analyses um, looking at Sentinel compared to controls. And this is a patient level pooled analysis, a large number of patients, 1300 patients. But you can see um, that uh, again, early on, so this is 72 hours, um, pretty impressive reductions here in overall stroke rates, mortality of stroke and disabling stroke. Um, so, you know, the question is, um, you know, can we um, convincingly see a, a reduction in randomized clinical studies um, in stroke rates and that I'll come to that, but that does require very large um, sample sizes. Um, so on the basis of, of this approval, of course, one of the questions is what, uh, you know, what is the penetration um, in the United States? Um, and this was presented just last year from, uh, by Dave Cohen, again, from the TBT registry, um, showing that um, this is 2019, um, Q4 of 2019, about 30% of centers in the United States are using the Sentinel or, or have the Sentinel device, excuse me, and only about 13% of patients actually receive the, the Sentinel device. So uh, clearly, I think there is a gap um, in, our, um, in, in, in the evidence supporting the use of this device. And, and again, we need the convincing clinical studies that will show us that this really makes a difference in terms of, of clinical strokes. So more on that in a bit. All right, I'm going to switch over and talk a little bit about the work that I've done uh, with the Trigon device. So this is a completely different concept. It's a deflector device. You can see um, that essentially the way the device works is that it's positioned in the arch of the aorta and it just basically blocks the cerebral vessels uh, through this mesh. This is placed um, not through the arm, but through a femoral access. Uh, and um, uh, using an eight, eight French um, sheath, and the same sheath that you can use the um, the guy the um, the pigtail catheter. So when we started working with uh, with um, Triguard or Keystone is the company, we we started with this very first um, iteration of the device, very simple, crude. I would say, as you can see here, it was relatively small. It was a nine French. You can see here the mesh and pore sizes. And then this eventually was iterated to this next generation, which was much more stable um, and had a bigger footprint. And, and you can see um, at least conceptually would um, have, uh, would be much more effective in, in, in being positioned, stabilized in the arch and uh, deflecting debris. I want to take you back um, to our very early evaluation. So we worked on the first generation of the device um, in a CE mark study uh, that was relatively small. It was, I believe, it was 37 patients. Demonstrated that um, you know the device could be positioned and it was safe, and um, it eventually got uh, CE mark in in, in Europe. And this was the next stage. So DFLEG3 was really intended to benchmark events in preparation for an IDE trial. We, we were just beginning to understand how the device worked. We were trying to understand what the best endpoints were. We didn't really understand very much about the, the um, diffusion-weighted MRI metrics. 
And that was sort of the underlying purpose of uh, DFLEC3. So it was a one-to-one -one randomized clinical study, very simple. Again, in terms of the assessments, uh, very much similar to what I've shown you for the NeuroTAVA. We had uh, uh, same neurologists doing the assessments and screening, uh, included some neurocognitive assessments. Here's the procedure. Four days later, we did the MRI. Again, uh, thorough and um, complete neurologic assessment. And then we followed these patients with an, another second diffusion-weighted MRI assessment at 30 days. And uh, again, um, neurologist um, assessment. Uh, it was small, 83 patients uh, uh, randomized here. Um, I think one of the things that we learned very early is the last two MRI follow-up in these types of studies, which is a major limitation in my, in, in, um, in my mind. Uh, we lose patients because uh, many of them go off to have uh, pacemakers, many of them refuse, <laughs> and some of them are just too sick. Um, to undergo diffusion-weighted MRI. And you can see some of the loss to follow up here are precisely the patients that we need to look at, those with, uh, with strokes. Nonetheless, uh, we looked at device performance, um, actually found that it was quite good. 87% um, had technical success. Um, one of the things that we were trying to understand is if the device was properly positioned throughout the procedure, what were the outcomes? So we defined this per treatment population that was um, that had con complete um, cerebral coverage throughout the procedure. Overall, in, in hospital safety outcomes were very good. Um, and again, just comparing this to the Sentinel, it was a much uh, broader endpoint. So we had 22 versus 31. It was, uh, uh, we felt this was safe and um, comparable to our controls. Um, and then going into the diffusion weighted MRI and the imaging um, outcomes, again, it wasn't powered for anything, but we certainly saw this, the uh, trends in reduction, this is in the intent to treat population and the per treatment. So if the device was well positioned, we had meaningful uh, reductions in the overall uh, brain lesion volume. And the other interesting observation here is that we, we, we sort of shift from larger lesions to smaller or no lesions with treatment. Um, and this is a recurrent theme that we're seeing with these devices. So again, felt that this was um, certainly uh, trends in the right direction and would, um, would support going forward with an IDE and approval study in the United States. So one of the interesting findings, and again, we did uh, diffusion weighted MRI both at the end of the procedure and at 30 days. Um, if you take a look at this, 84% of these lesions actually reverse, go away at 30 days. So this is, again, a work in progress. We're trying to understand um, what this means. We're trying to understand um, the clinical relevance of this. Now, if you talk to the neuro on, uh, neurology colleagues, they will tell you that reversibility does not mean that this is not uh, a stroke. Um, and this is just an imaging sort of, um, not an artifact, but just a finding because of the healing process of brain tissue. So, um, so it's not because these go away over time that they are not uh, relevant. So um, this, again, we're trying to better understand and we're in the process of um, digging into this based on our uh, data sets. Here are the uh, clinical outcomes that we saw in terms of NIH stroke scales and MOCA, and again, all showing um, some good trends um, favoring, uh, favoring your protection. And interesting uh, data points here looking at MOCA. So MOCA is uh, looking at the, uh, a, a, an overall screening tool for neurocognition. Um, again, showing sort of the right trends in terms of 
improve, um, improvements um, or at least stabilization here with deflection compared to controls uh, from baseline to discharge. And we found, again, short-term memory tests and delayed tests uh, showing improvements with, um, with deflection. So we were all very excited about this uh, based on this relatively small study. And once again, we show this gradation, um, again, speaking back to the, um, to the neural arc and sort of which endpoint to use and sort of the, um, you know, how, how um, diverse the, the outcomes can be uh, depending on the definition that we use. So this um, takes us to the REFLECT program. This was our pivotal trial uh, in the United States. It turned out to be, it's, it's much larger, 523 patients. We started phase one with the first generation of the device. The, the trial became very complicated because as we got towards the end of phase one, um, we convinced um, the sponsor to actually um, shift the trial to uh, the next iteration, the next version of the device. Um, we kept phase one blinded because we wanted to use the controls from phase one to combine them with phase two and increase the number of control patients. We had um, obviously two, endpoint, two primary endpoints, safety endpoint and an efficacy endpoint. And um, long story short, um, I will just show you the, the, the results of these um, two studies summarized in two slides. We essentially failed uh, the effectiveness endpoints in both of these studies. And I think a lot of different lessons learned uh, from these, uh, these trials. So, um, again, we were, we were powered to look at safety against a performance goal. We certainly met that. Um, however, when we compared the safety endpoint compared to the controls, the numbers were numerically higher. So, and that was significant. So there were higher events with TriGuard compared to the controls. And when we looked at um, the uh, efficacy endpoints, Again, we did, we did not meet that um, the uh, effectiveness. Um, interestingly here, when we went back and looked at the performance of the device, we found that uh, we only had full coverage in 57% of cases. So this device really was not stable. And that was the reason um, to shift to the next iteration of the device. But one of the interesting um, observations, and again, we're learning from this uh, in a post hoc analysis, looking at different thresholds, different lesion sizes, what you can see is that compared to the controls here on the top panel, um, while we're not making any difference here in terms of the small lesions, um, as you get to the larger lesions, we seem to be preventing larger lesions when the device is in place. So something to uh, keep in mind as we, um, as we keep looking and uh, evaluating these types of technologies. This is REFLECT2, again, all summarized in one slide. We met our primary safety endpoint. This is the bigger device, the more supposedly st more stable device. Uh, but once again, when we look at the, compare the two groups in terms of the safety outcome, you can see that you have more events here with TriGuard compared to the controls. Uh, this was primarily driven by more vascular complications, but coming to efficacy, once again, we did not meet the efficacy endpoint. This is based on a win ratio and a score. So negative numbers are worse than positive numbers. So we actually did worse with TriGuard compared to controls. Um, there were numerically more strokes um, and just we just did not do well. So what happened? Um, and <laughs> so, uh, you know, it, it was a very uh, interesting um, uh, lesson, I would say, in, in conducting these uh, clinical studies. So first observation here is that full coverage of this device was only about 60%. So while the device was supposed to be more stable, it really was not stable enough um, uh, to, um, 
and I don't think was ready for prime time. Um, I think the, the, um, in the, the clinical study was actually launched and without enough supervision and um, oversight in how the procedures were being done. So this, um, the usage of the device, I don't think was done properly with enough feedback to the centers. And I think it really speaks to sort of the co conduct of clinical studies. Having said that, again, when we take a look at these um, MR MRIs and what we're seeing here is that, um, again, when you take a look at the larger volumes, uh, the device does seem to, uh, at least uh, you can see this visually, prevent the larger um, lesions, so the larger uh, 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 amount of vet injury when you have treatment, specifically when the, the device is in place and is stable. So again, lessons learned from, uh, from this, um, this whole uh, experience. This is just another sort of graphic way of looking at this. This is the per treatment population. So again, when the device is well positioned, um, you can see that with uh, the intervention, um, you do have sort of separation of the curves here. And this is looking at the, uh, the stroke population. All these patients had stroke, but as um, you go out here to the larger lesions, there seems to be um, sort of a, a, a differentiation here in the size of uh, the injury um, amongst these uh, patients with stroke. Um, this is a, a teaser where we're working now uh, with the pooled data set to really try and correlate um, the lesion size with um, symptoms. Uh, this is simply showing that there is a correlation with um, worsening NIH stroke scales post-procedure. I don't think this is sort of the end of the story. We're going to have to look at this a little bit further, but uh, clearly um, it would appear, at least from this in initial analysis, that size or uh, ischemic size uh, matters and uh, is linked to, um, to uh, symptoms. So again, that's something that we're going to be looking, looking at further. Um, many conclusions from reflect and uh, too many to discuss on this um, during this lecture, but I think many lessons from the contact, the conduct of clinical studies, the oversight of uh, clinical studies, but unfortunately uh, for reflect two, we, um, while we met the primary endpoint as it was defined, uh, using a performance goal, there were issues with um, safety and higher event rates there, even on the safety outcome, and certainly we did not uh, meet the effectiveness outcome. Um, for those of you following the space, uh, this was actually discussed at a panel meeting just recently over the summer, and um, FDA is still um, deciding on what to do with this, but I do not think that we're going to see an approved device here. All right, so next steps. Well, um, as I said, uh, you know, we're still facing a gap. So even with the Sentinel device being approved and on the market, clearly the penetration is uh, only about 10%, 10% uh, of patients uh, receiving this device. There are two large definitive trials. This is the protected TAVA trial. Um, which uh, I hope will be coming out uh, soon, I believe uh, next year. This is uh, 3,000 patients randomized one-to-one to, -one, um, to um, the Sentinel device versus no uh, protection. It's looking at an endpoint of stroke at 72 hours or a discharge and uh, is powered for stroke. So this will be uh, the definitive study to really address whether or not the Sentinel device um, helps patients on a clinical uh, uh, basis. There's a second um, uh, large randomized clinical study that's being uh, conducted in the United Kingdom sponsored by the British Heart Foundation. This trial you can see is uh, including 7,000 patients, seven, no, close to 8,000 patients. Um, again, same endpoint. This is a clinical stroke at 72 hours. So I think between these two studies, we will have 
um, definit uh, definitive answer in terms of um, the outcomes. But specific, I think, to the Sentinel device, we know the device is not perfect. Um, and, um, you know, we'll have to see what these, uh, these um, outcomes show. Just very quickly, um, what can we anticipate in the near future? Again, I think I mentioned this, there are a, a few trials that we're going to be seeing here in the US. Uh, first one is uh, the with this device, the Emberline device. It's a sheath-based um, uh, filter. Um, and as you can see here, it's based of, um, it's uh, made of nitinol. It's very soft. And I think one of the lessons learned here is all the, uh, with the current devices, all the friction um, um, can actually cause embolization. And I think this device is very soft and, and will um, hopefully prevent that from happening. It's a, it's a full body capture device. So you can see that the TAVI system would go through this capture the debris and then it's pulled back. So it's really sort of taking the, um, the whole, um, all the debris out of the body. A second device that's gonna be uh, looked at is the M-block device. Uh, you know, some pros and cons here, it's ephemeral access. Um, and again, that's uh, currently being looked at by FDA. And I think we can anticipate um, the trial starting um, early next year. And another one that I think is actually interesting, uh, maybe a little bit earlier stage, but is definitely uh, being vetted by the FDA in terms of its trial design, um, is, a, um, is called ProTembo. Uh, this again is a, a, a deflection device. It's uh, positioned through left radial six French access and self-positioning uh, against the aortic arch uh, to cover and, and deflect material from the cerebral vessels. Um, this one has very small pore sizes of 60 microns. We'll see, and it's very, uh, it looks to be very stable uh, once uh, positioned. So we'll have to see what the, um, what, um, what the results are with, with these two, um, with, the, with these three devices. So anyhow, th so this brings me to uh, the end of um, my talk. So very high level, I think uh, the take homes here, I think this is sort of a story in evolution. I think what we've learned is that uh, strokes are absolutely unpredictable. Uh, I didn't show you this, but there have been many, many efforts to look at predictors of stroke from the patient population. Um, and just, uh, you know, it's just very difficult to predict these patients. Clearly, from a patient perspective, this is oftentimes a, a fate worse than death. For them, they will uh, want to do anything to avoid the stroke. Um, I think it's fair to say that strokes, stroke um, complications are lower with TAVA compared to surgical AVR. And while we're very focused on this in the TAVA space, um, I think we shouldn't lose sight of that. Um, you know, this is ubiquitous. I think we we're absolutely convinced of this. We've seen brain injury in all cases when we use diffusion weighted MRI. And what we don't know, I think one of the big gaps is what are the clinical implications of this longer term for our patients? And that is a very difficult uh, question to answer because I think it needs longer term follow-up. It needs very large um, numbers of patients. And I think it's, uh, it's just, I'm not sure we will be able to address that question in the longer term. And of course, uh, the definitive trials are undergoing, uh, under, underway. And, um, you know, I, I would stress the fact that the definitive trials are going to be very device specific. They're going to be specific to the Sentinel device. And uh, whatever the outcomes are, I think we need to keep an open mind about some of the uh, newer technologies that we're uh, currently evaluating. So um, that wraps up my talk. I'm very happy to, to take uh, questions and I'll stop sharing here. Thank you, Dr. Lansky. That was a wonderful review on this topic. Um, for the, um, I'm just gonna share my screen for the CME's credit, but um, feel free to type in the chat group if you have any questions. Um, 
I can start with some questions. I was um, just thinking about that number, the 10% of patient actually getting the device and the 30% of hospital actually utilizing it. What do you think is the main barrier here? Why is the uh, rate so low? You know, it's interesting. Um, we, uh, we, you know, anytime we are on a panel uh, discussing sort of the controversies and the pros and the cons, um, you know, it's a very biased group. Obviously, when we when we discuss it on panels, most of the people that are selected to, to discuss this are pro users, obviously. I think the numbers are, reflect our evidence. I mean, we just need the evidence. We need to show that this ha actually has a clinical impact um, and reduces stroke. And I don't think we have that ev evidence right now. And I think um, that's the challenge. Now, you know, some centers do use it. Um, I don't know if, if you use it at uh, VCU. I'm, I'm curious uh, to hear your experience. Um, you know, and, and typically, I mean, I'll tell you what we do at Yale is it's it's selective. So if there, I'm sorry, the sun is coming through, blowing <laughs> here, but um, I, I think you hear my voice. Um, so we, we tend to select it in patients that we feel are at extreme risk of a stroke complication. Um, and I think that's, that's you know, what we're seeing around the country. Um, and again, we're waiting for those randomized clinical studies. We need those trials. The challenge there is that they're large. Um, you know, when you're looking at an event rate uh, of two and a half percent, you have to include 3,000, 4,000, up to 8,000 patients really to be able to demonstrate a, a difference. So it, it's, uh, it's a difficult space to, you know, to evaluate. And again, I mean, there's so many different issues in, in the evaluation of these patients. You know, if you think about neuroprotection, it, it cannot eliminate stroke. We will never be able to eliminate stroke complications with a neuroprotection device. Why? because there are other complications that these patients have. I mean, if there's an arrest on the table, if there's hypotension, if there is, you know, there are other issues that are going on that really neuroprotection will not be able to address. So, you know, just, it, it's a complicated um, space. And I think, again, the other issue about, you know, what are the long-term effects of having acutely asymptomatic with subclinical uh, neurologic injury. I know I don't want to have that in my brain, you know, if I have my TAVI. Um, so, uh, you know, again, I think, I think the evidence is building um, and, you know, we're going to have to wait for the big randomized trials to see greater penetration um, with these types of devices. No, that's very fair. I think that's, um, one of the major reasons why we're not using it here at VCU. And interestingly that you mentioned that you, uh, at Yale, you would select it for high-risk patient. And I was wondering like, how do you define that? Is that a procedural high-risk or a certain morphology of the valve or the arteries that you look at? Right, I mean, it's gonna be case by case, um, you know, depending on, yeah, there are some clinical factors, patients with atrial fibrillation, if there's, you know, an LV thrombus or, you know, again, I mean, these are extreme cases um, where there, the, you know, the, the risk of stroke is, is apparent. And in those situations, you know, we will use it. But for the most part, we don't, to be honest. So, so that's interesting. So at, at VCU, you don't use them. Do you have the devices available to you or, or, or not? Um, I wonder if Dr. Lawson or Dr. Gertz, our uh, inter, uh, proceduralist, can answer that if they're still on the group chat. So maybe uh, while we wait here, yeah. uh, so Dr. Vetrovec is asking uh, my comments on how FDA should look at these devices. 
Yeah, uh, Andrea, if I can just jump yeah. in. I've sat on the two panels that you referred to, and mm -hmm. I think particularly in the case of the first one, the panel was sympathetic because of the risk of stroke more than the data. I, I, you know, you can never speak for how the panel is looking at it. But the second one, uh, I think maybe they were, was a little bit different. They already had a device, so they didn't feel as compelled. So, I mean, I think there's all these strange things that go on. And of course, it's ultimately the FDA's decision. But how should the FDA really look at this? Because it's going to probably always be a tough call because of so many conflicting things, as you know. Right. So, you, you know, I think FDA is, um, they made a decision on Sentinel. Um, and it was a soft, I mean, I think the decision was made because, um, you know, there was nothing to lose. I, 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 maybe that's the right way of putting it. The, the device was shown to be safe. Um, there was no convincing evidence of effectiveness based on the pre-specified metrics, uh, but nonetheless, debris was captured in all cases. So I think the, the, the position of FDA was, okay, well, you know, we're, we don't have anything to lose here, as you said, right? Um, the problem they have going forward is that, that they established that as a benchmark. So anybody coming afterwards is saying, okay, well, all I need to do, you know, this is a 510K and you know the process for that. All we have to do is show that we're, you know, equivalent to that, right? And that's difficult because essentially what companies are doing now or new devices is saying, well, we're safe and we're, you know, we're, we're you know, in the same ballpark. So let's just show that we can capture debris or that we can reduce some MRI lesions and we're just, you know, we're as good as. And I think that's where the challenge is for the FDA. Um, and, and that's where I think that the rigor in the clinical studies is gonna come. I also think that, you know, FDA is gonna be very interested in looking at these randomized clinical studies and trying to kind of reset the tone going forward. Um, I think in the last panel that you, you sat on, I mean, I think the challenges there were very different. Um, I think the, sa the um, safety uh, metrics were not in favor of the device. Right, they met the benchmarks uh, against the performance goal, but but you know safety was not um, you know there were significant differences favoring control, not the device. So um, you know I th I think that was probably an easier call for the FDA to say, you know not not ready for prime time. Thank you. Can you guys hear me now, Shin? Yeah. I, sorry, I was trying to unmute, couldn't get it to work. But um, at VCU, we do not physically have the Sentinel device. We met with the uh, reps from the industry a few years ago. And I think sort of based on um, cost of the device, lack of reimbursement, and sort of the paucity of data, we, we haven't really jumped into it yet. It's sort of as you alluded to in terms of needing more um, support and, and, I just think, and training. Um, so that's, that's where we are at VCU in terms of the protection. Yeah, well, so you're you're part of the seventy percent of clinical centers around around the country, and you know I, I think I think that's right. I think let's you know we need to wait to make sure that this this works, and um, you know understand a little bit more about it. All right, I'm going to read another question here. It seems that positioning is the biggest barrier to try God efficacy. Can you talk about retrieval? and how the device is sealed prior to extraction. So actually this is a really uh, you know, interesting question um, because the way, you know, when, when the trial was conducted and it was very complicated, um, we were brought in sort of at the tail end of the study. Um, and when we were brought in, we realized that the cases had not been reviewed on an ongoing basis. So there was really no oversight of the procedures. And when we started looking at the cases, we realized that, you know, again, I showed it, six, only 60% of cases actually had complete coverage. 
And um, so that speaks to several things. One is um, it's, it's quite difficult in, um, under fluoroscopy to actually see the positioning of the device. And um, we realized that there was issues with, um, uh, you know, when, when there was issues with the stability of the device. Um, there was a lot of interaction, as it turned out, between the TAVI delivery system and the, um, the filter. And the other issue that I think is, is critical, when we look at when strokes happen, they don't just happen at the time of procedure, they, they go on, right, afterwards. And what um, I think is a little bit misguided in these procedures is once we get the filter in, we should be keep it, keeping it in for the as long as possible. In other words, we should be taking out the TAVI delivery system, keep the filter in place, and remove that at the very, very last moment uh, that we can, even if the patient stays there on the table a little longer, just to ensure that we're not, you know, we're capturing as much as we possibly can. And what I observed looking at all these cases was, you know, here's the end of the procedure, we take out everything in one fell swoop. And I think that was, that was a mistake. So, um, you know, I don't know if that addresses your question, but I, I think, again, as we deploy this in clinical practice, I think there's going to be nuances in how we do this. And really, the learning curve is a steeper learning curve than we initially anticipated. And I think you answered the next question, too. Yeah, right. So, um, you know, the next question, I, I, there is a, uh, a, a group and a device that we're working with now and helping them through, again, work, work through FDA um, IDE process, but, but a, a different concept where the device stays in. So, you know, you do your procedure with, um, with the filter in place and you actually send the patient back to the room with the device in place and actually remove the device the following day. So that's a completely different concept, trying to address this kind of tail to the, um, to the you know, incidence of stroke there. So we'll see how that goes. I think that, um, that yeah, there's a whole set of new issues that come up with that, that we're trying to, to work with. Sounds good. Um, we have one last question, but I think we're about to run out of time. Um, and I don't know, why. I can email you this question and see if we can just sort it out um, on a later time. Well, thank you so much for your time, Dr. Lenski. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. I look forward to, to talking to you guys later. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye. Bye.